John, you are such a good boy. I know you will succeed. Thanks, Nana. You are a good boy, and good boys deserve treats. Hooray! I am going to bake you some cookies. Mm. <laughs> the hag mentioned cookies. Pursue her. Oh, God damn it. It's just what you need, more baked goods. John, you do not say no to cookies. I command you to get them. You totally abjure the hell out of that idea. You're so busy abjuring, you don't even notice Rose has been trying to pester you this whole time. Rose. Hit John in the head with the box to get his attention. You give John a swift drubbing in the knot, but he's undeterred. Man, that is some fit he's throwing. Perhaps you will take this spare moment to contemplate the Nana Sprite's strange tale. It may also behoove you to record your thoughts on these developments in your GameFAQs walkthrough slash journal. It can be hard to find time to update it. In fact, you're not even sure where you found the time to write what's already there. Oh, is that so, Jasper? And just who do you think you're looking at with that smug grin? Huh? The last thing you need is sass from a dead cat. It's pretty much all his fault you're in this mess in the first place, so he can just butt it. John, cookies, now! You refuse outright. No, this impudence no, is insufferable! No, Go get the cookies! Well, when you put it so politely, how can John decline? John, you're stupid! You really need to work on your manners. Stupid, stupid, dumb! That's not a command. It's nothing. It's stupid. You're stupid. For the last time, I command you to get the cookies, boy. No! It's just not gonna happen, buddy. No! Years in the future. But really not enough to write home on. An agitated finger slips mid-keystroke. The long and short. The medium, too. I may have been a bit hasty in advising you not to bother with the prototyping process. If I spared any detail, it was only to optimize your chances of survival. And if you find yourself begrudging the absence of certain instructions, which if followed would have resulted in your demise, then I guess that makes two of us. Otherwise, you're welcome. But the fact appears to be that prototyping the Colonel Sprite before making your getaway may offer the only opportunity to exercise control over your new environment, a place known as the Medium. Also, if prototyped with one or two sufficiently, albeit loosely humanoid and or sentient elements, living or otherwise, it offers the chance to have all this explained to you by an apparitional guide through whatever sort of cryptic, sketchy doublespeak your choice of prototyping elements engenders. In lieu of this, you may be forced to settle for my clear, thorough explanations and assiduous dissection of raw data. Again, don't mention it. If you've made it to the medium with an unmolested vanilla sprite, well, I've already covered the bad news about this missed opportunity, and I will go into this further soon. Though to what extent this actually is bad news, I'm not sure. I know only the result of my co-player's current configuration, wherein the sprite was prototyped once before the departure and once after. Which brings us to the good news, which is that you can still prototype after your departure, and salvage the massively rewarding experience of haggling with an exposition-slinging phantom guide, so long as you avoid prototyping with terribly inert items, such as a brass door knocker in your father's pornography collection. Actually, that might be interesting. If you are struck by the spirit of such experimentation, please don't hesitate to contact me about it. So yes, you can enhance your sprite this way, but doing so after your departure will no longer induce this effect on the medium I alluded to. That can only be accomplished with one or more pre-departure prototypings. In fact, we can extrapolate there are only so many ways to prototype a sprite. Tiers of prototyping in relation to departure. Both before, one before, one after, both after, only one, either before or after, or none. Those occurring before will affect the medium through the kernel's hatching process, and your guide, i.e. the sprite. Those occurring after will only affect the sprite. The effects this process has on the medium, or more globally, the incipisphere, are still vague to me. They have to do with flavoring the forces you will struggle against, and generally, all forces at odds with each other in this realm. It has given me some insight to the nature of the game, which again I derive through extrapolation. We appear to be engaging an instance of a dimension with a highly flexible set parameters, and a series of objectives surrounding an equally flexible mythological framework. This framework seems to begin as a sort of blank template, and evolves with the player's actions and likely further evolves with the addition of more host-client connections, and thus more prototyped kernels. 
I regret to say I can't be much more specific than that without loosely extrapolating further. There are plenty of questions that have occurred to me, however. Questions concerning the kernel sprite, which I've raised implicitly already, such as what is the effect of an unprototyped kernel on the medium, or a doubly prototyped kernel for that matter, and even more salient to the questions about this dimension itself. Do all players worldwide make it to this dimension if they successfully complete their departure? Or is a unique, blank instance of the dimension created for each new player? I have no evidence but instinct tells me it is closer to the latter situation. There is no indication of any other players present in this realm. Alterations in the realm seem singularly centered on the actions of my co-player and myself. If I had to stake anything on it, I would guess every separate client-server pair activates its own fresh copy of an Encephosphere, or a unique session, if you will. But the quantity of players is a further complication, which invites more questions. It seems the game was designed to suit two players most naturally, the server and the client, but the a mishap, my co-player and I have slipped out of the obvious tandem arrangement, and the only logical course of action to continue playing is to string a daisy chain of server-client connections together until presumably the chain is complete. Theoretically, we could complete this chain with only one other player, functioning as a server to my client, and the client to my current co-player's server, assuming he can recover it. The strange thing is, though, in our instance of this dimension, there are four receptacles for divided kernels, not three. Does this mean we are destined to have a four-player chain? How could the game know such a thing? Perhaps it does, and if this proves to be the case, I will be sufficiently numb to the realization. Rethink organization? Lead may be waist-deep logaric sludge. Trim down. Blah. She's not finished with this yet. Jeez, cut her some slack. Maybe you could go bug someone somewhere else for a while? Or at the very least, some when else? Months in the past, but not many. Uh, hi! Happy birthday, Rose! <laughs> Hello, and thanks. Did you get John's present yet? I just opened it this very moment. What a stunning coincidence you would ask about it now. I am stunned. Yeah, I know. What will you make with it? And who said it was something from which something else could be made? Well, John did tell me what it was. Duh. I suppose I'll take a stab at learning the craft. It's the least I can do in response to the subtle dig concealed in his gesture. He often tells me I need a new hobby when I make perfectly reasonable analytical remarks. No, but Rose, I don't think he meant anything like that by it. You see, not everybody always means the opposite of what they say, the way you and Dave always do. Maybe. His birthday is in a few months, isn't it? Yup. I finally finished the present for him. I've been working on it for years. Years? It's so hard to tell when you're joking, or if you're even capable of it. <laughs> I just mailed it too, so it is sure to get there on time. Mail takes a while to get anywhere from here. I'll probably craft something with strong sentimental value. That should burn him. <laughs> I don't think you really mean that. I guess not. So, shall I expect a green package dropped to my house via airmail from whatever screwball cranny of the globe you're tucked into? <laughs> Oh, sorry, but you are sort of hard to shop for. Besides, I have something for you today that I think you will like better than something in a box. Oh? <laughs> it is a tip! This is already intriguing enough to compensate for the grave scarcity of lavish gifts parachuting from the sky. Please go on. Did you have a pet a long time ago that died? Yes. Okay, well, how did you feel about your cat? Did you love him a lot? Okay, well, I didn't mention it was a cat, or that it was male. Let's pretend I'm surprised and you're embarrassed and move on. To answer your question, I would describe my feelings toward the animal as lukewarm. Um, okay. That's fine. It doesn't really matter, I think. Just, what if someone told you you could play a game that would bring him back to life? If someone told me that, I would regard the remark with a great deal of skepticism. If that someone was you, on the other hand, then I would have to ask preemptively, is that someone you? Yes, that someone is me! I just thought he might find it interesting. So what is this game? No, I don't know. I'm just saying is all. I think you'll hear about it later, and maybe you can talk to John and Dave about it. They're way more into all that stuff than I am. <laughs> I'll see what the word on the street is about it. In due time. For now, I should probably order a copy of Knitting for Assholes. It would be a shame if I ran late with John's present. Dave, 
Get katana. You capture log your katana. 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 plus 2 plus 1 equals 9 modulus 10 equals 9. And prepare to venture out into the apartment to retrieve your bro's copy of the game. But first, maybe, just maybe. Dave, retrieve dead bird. Dude, that bird is long gone. It probably won't last long in this heat anyway. You don't even know what's up with this sick heat. The sun threatens to set, but won't step off. It's staring you down like the big red eye of a hot needle, skipping on a groove it's tracing around the earth. While lingering in midair, its heat seems to suspend time itself, stretching it like warped vinyl. It's meant to rain this season, but there ain't been a drop in sight. Even a little drizzle would help. It might help to fizzle this sizzle a little bizzle. Set the record straight on this global turn tizzle. So don't change the drizzle. Turn it up a little. I've got a living room full of fine dime grizzles, waiting on the pizzle, the dizzle and the shizzle. Jeez to the bizzack. Now ladies, here we gizzo. When the pimp's in the crib, ma, drop it like it's hard, drop it like it's hard, drop it like it's hard. English romantic poet, John Keats. Dave, exit your room and go into the living room. Sorry, little dude. Coming through. Gotta put you down for a bit. You figure you've left him hanging long enough. Dave, hastily enter the room with wild abandon. You barge in and see a familiar face. A friendly face. You stand in the living room. Your bro spends most of his days here. At night, he crashes on the futon over there. You don't see him anywhere, though. There's the puppet chest he stores little Cal in when he takes him out on gigs. But when he's home, he usually leaves Cal on display somewhere. And with good reason, because Cal is totally sweet. So sweet. Man. Dave, pity to fool. It's your brother's Mr. T puppet, which of course is kept in the apartment with a sense of profound humorous irony. But as usual with your bro's exploits, this is no ordinary irony, or anything close to a pedestrian tier one ironic gesture, which is a meager single step removed from sincerity. This is like 10 levels of irony removed from the original joke. It might have been funny like eight years ago to joke about Mr. T and how he was sort of lame, but that was the very thing that made him awesome and badass and that his awesomeness was also sort of the joke. But in this case, the joke is the joke. And that degree of irony itself is also the joke. And so on. Only highly adept satirical ninjas like you and your bro can appreciate stuff like this. It's cool taking stuff that other people think is funny but you know really isn't, and making it funny again by adding subtle strata of irony, which are utterly undetectable to the untrained eye. Also, for good measure, Mr. T is wearing a leather thong and handcuffed to a pantsless Chuck Norris puppet. God, you hope you can be as good as your bro at this someday. You'd never tell him that, though. Dave, find little Cal and give fist bumps. Cal's nowhere in sight. All you see is a bunch of your bro's weird new puppets thrown about haphazardly. You... You guess these things are kinda cool. Sort of. Dave, play a game on the Xbox. It looks like your bro was playing. It's not like him to leave in the middle of some totally intense gaming. Not like him to misplace Cal, either. Man, you hope the little guy's alright. Oh, there you are, dude. Didn't see you there. We be chill today, Cal? Yeah, you better fucking believe we be chill. Cal is the man. Dave, resist great urge to play bro's Xbox. You fail to resist the urge. You start thrashing up stunts something uncanny brutal on your quest for mad snacks, yo. And get this way rude hunger under control. Shit is basically flying off the hook. It's like shit wants nothing to do with that hook. The hook is dead to that shit. But you get stuck on some poorly modeled 3D fixture or something. Like a railing or a piece of wall. You'll have to reset. Fuck this shit. Dave, give little Cal a bro fist bump. Aw oh man, you almost forgot. You gotta give the C-Man some props. Dave. Check out your bro's sweet gear. Your bro has so much sweet gear, it's hard to keep up with it all sometimes. Here's his computer setup. He's usually got a lot of stuff cooking on here at any given moment. Since he's not around, you might as well sneak a peek. Dave, look at your brother's computer. Your bro's computer is password protected, of course, to protect all the incredible top secret shit he's got on the burners. Of course you know what the password is, and he knows you know it, and you're both cool with that because the password is the most awesome thing it can be. You enter the password. On the desktop is a hodgepodge of unnamed folders to store all the stuff he's working on. No one can decipher his organization system but him. He also tends to use the application Complete Bullshit to keep up with the lucrative amounts of websites and news feeds he monitors to stay hip to the scene. Dave, open Complete Bullshit. <sighs> 
This is complete bullshit. Dave, check if Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff has a sweet update. Your bro keeps up with your projects in his aggregator, just like you keep up with his. He's tuned into your various blogs, and of course, Sweet Bro and Hella Jeff. You navigate to the latest comic in one of the many bullshit feed bands. Everybody get up to <laughs> Sweet I got For big man! Dave, mouse over the orange stripe containing plush rump.